Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Getting to the Point. I am your host, Cindy Skalicki, the founder of On Point Communications. And today I'm bringing you a special guest. Her name is Jane Stein, and she has a business called Your Franchise is Waiting. How are you today, Jane? Thanks so much for joining us. Very well, thank you. Yes, I wanted to bring you on today, Jane, because you are an expert in your field. And getting to the point is all about getting to the point of people's areas of mastery. So I love the area you work in. It's a, I think it's an area that might be somewhat unfamiliar to our audience unless they've ever run a franchise. But we've all gone to franchise restaurants and participated in the business transactions of franchises. So I'm excited to hear more about the innards of what you do. Why don't I first start by just sharing with the audience how we met years ago. Actually, Jane was a referral to me from a network um, person that I know, Tannis, and I ended up working with your son, Elliot, Jane, and Elliot is now coming, he's out of college now, and we did some work on interpersonal skills and conversation um, style and, and things of that nature when he was uh, working with me that summer. And you also wrote a book about Elliot. It's called Just Elliot. So would you tell us just briefly about Elliot and then maybe introduce us to your business? Sure. Um, my son Elliot, who's 22, is an amazing young man. He's on the autism spectrum. And when he was very young in elementary school, he had some challenges because he had some behaviors that maybe the other kids didn't really understand. He was, you know, constantly digging at his shirt and uncomfortable in his clothing. And um, so little mean girls would sometimes come up to me and say, what's wrong with Elliot? And I would say nothing, you know, he's just Elliot. <laughs> so that was the impetus for the book. Years later, I ran into a casual acquaintance and she said she was a children's book author. And I said, oh my gosh, I've had this idea germinating in my head for 15 years about a book I'd like to write geared towards neurotypical children to understand the Elliots in their classroom. Because mm -hmm. if you're in a classroom of 25, 30 kids, one or two of them is gonna be on the spectrum. And let's foster that understanding. So we created the book and that was the impetus. And the book is called Just Elliot. It really is a beautiful book, and I've, I was interested in it for other reasons, too, because I'm married to a neuropsychologist, and so there was a little bit of familiarity with the autism spectrum uh, to begin with. So, well, thanks for sharing that about Elliot. Tell us about your franchise is waiting and how long you've been involved in that business, and then I want to hit on our three points. Sure. So, um, I was a stockbroker for many years with what is now Morgan Stanley and I retired pretty young and about eight years into retirement I was very bored and wanting some intellectual stimulation beyond volunteering and I started clicking around on the internet to buy a franchise because my understanding of a franchise was you throw money at it and somebody runs it for you and you just reap the lovely dividends so <clears throat> easy. <laughs> so I start clicking around on the internet and my phone is literally lit up with franchise brokers wanting to sell me a franchise. Um, and I, it was kind of an aha moment. The, the summary of the big aha was this is an industry that's ripe for professionalism because I was not impressed with any of the seven or eight gentlemen that I spoke with on the telephone. And um, I felt like this was an interesting, it's, a cons it's basically you're a consultant, you work the, the, the perfect side of the business, the best case scenario is that you work with individuals who, may, who have maybe been tinkering with the idea of investing in a franchise. They probably don't know much about it, evidenced by the fact that they're clicking on the internet thinking that's how you get information. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, that's all lead portals for salespeople. 
Got it. So I felt like I could really bring in a, a whole other echelon of professionalism and with my resources and things I could bring to the table with my financial background. So that was the launch of my business. Awesome. So it sounds like you talked to a lot of people that were brokers, but none of them were really anything to write home about. And you thought, uh, geez, I've got a great background. I could do this easily and I could probably hop into this pool and rise above some of the people that you had just talked with on the phone. So, well, that's fantastic. I think this is really timely in light of the fact that we're all amidst this global pandemic, which, you know, has really adjusted and uh, abruptly in some cases has, you know, turned over a lot of people's um, jobs and situations in life. I know of several people who have really had massive blows to their income streams. And so, you know, there are people watching today who might be interested in what it takes to actually start a franchise or purchase one. And then what happens once you own it and, and kind of all the steps that go into that, because it's not the same as, you know, popping up your own small business. There's a lot of different pieces to help you. Uh, but, but would you talk to us maybe for our first piece here about, you know, who makes a good franchise owner and why? What kind of personality, skill sets, what do they need to, what, who makes a good one? Let's start sure. there. Um, so in our business, there's the joke that we all share, which is when you ask the franchise development team, so, you know, who's successful in your, in your, of your profile, you know, of your franchisees and who really, what would, what would cause one to fail in this business? And the answer is always failure to follow our systems. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a joke because it's a pat answer, but it is true that in order to be successful in a franchise system, you have to understand that you're buying someone else's business, right? Mm -hmm. They spent the million dollars developing it. They worked in that business. Oftentimes it's a founder who had this lovely business for 10 years, 20 years and decided, hey, I can make this replicatable. Um, and, but it's his and, or her business and they're very interested in protecting their brand. Yeah. So what you um, are buying into is a system of support a system where the operations manual is done, the CRM is done, all the technology is done, the marketing package is sort of handed to you for you to execute, but it is indeed someone else's, you know, vision. Now, in a good franchise system, the corporate team is very, very interested in the franchisees' opinions and input, and they have franchise advisory councils, and they very much want to hear what the franchisees are experiencing to make improvements to the brand based on franchisees' experiences. I'm going to need to cough, so. Okay. <laughs> So when you're investing in a, in a franchise, it is very much about um, uh, being a, a rule follower, being willing to execute on exactly the systems as they're provided to you, and not being somebody who always thinks they can do it a better way. Um, in an emerging brand where they you know, are brand new and maybe they only have five locations open, it very well may be true that you have a better way. And if you're in a brand like that, that's different. You're able to help the brand, you know, prosper by using your field experience. But in a brand where they've already been successful, there's a hundred or more open locations, they figured it out. So it's really behooves you to just do it the way they tell you to do it. And the people who shape against that, really um, struggle. They struggle in the brand and they struggle to execute properly. And that's why most franchisors really want military people. Oh, wow. That's fantastic. That's, fa that's fascinating. I completely see the connection there. They're very good at following orders, doing things by the book. And that makes, that actually makes perfect sense. I love that. You're reminding me of, uh, you know, this past spring, our family kind of got in, into watching this show called The Prophet by Marcus. Oh my God, I'm so in love with Marcus. Yes. Yes. 
he's an amazing leader and I really uh, have grown to enjoy watching him converse with his, you know, the people he's trying to help. And in one of the episodes, it was all about this franchise location and it was about Greek food and I'm not remembering the name of it, but what I found so fascinating was that when he talked with the franchisor, that's the owner, right, of the franchise, and, and then the franchisees, the people that are, you know, doing, the, that are holding down the forts in other locations, he hardly ever communicated with them and left them kind of to their own devices. And there was this relationship that was fractured. So he came in and did, you know, another layer of, of help and provided some rep reparation for that so that they could all grow together and feel connected. But I really appreciate what you're saying about how the owners, you know, they've done their, they've done it all. They, they know what works. The system they, they want to duplicate is already there for you. So if you think you want to go in and be innovative and try your own thing, maybe franchising is not for you. But I think the value is in having the trust. Would you agree? Like you have to trust the person whose franchise you bought that they know what they're doing and they're kind of letting you do more of their, you know, brand building with them, which is kind of cool. 100%, yeah. And that's why, and it will lead right into the next segment, but that's why due diligence is so important because yes, it's important to trust them and you don't often know who the corporate team is mm -hmm. until you're way down the road in the discovery process because mm -hmm. they have sales teams. Right. So you're talking to this development person who you have rapport with and he or she is great. Guess what? You're never going to talk to that person again. They're right. not the ops person. They're not the day-to-day -day contact that you're going to have. You have to meet those people. Right. Eyeball to eyeball. And Jane, they don't let you do that until the very end of the process. Right. Could I slide in here? Maybe could for our audience just to understand and have some franchises in mind. Give us a quick, like in my mind, and because this was enlightening when you and I talked offline prior to this recording, um, you know, I'm always thinking of places like Subway and my brother has talked a lot about some coffee places that are up in, you know, started up in the Northwest. Dutch Bros is one. I mean, I know some of the franchise. Can you give us a list of like some that people already know? And then you told me about some others that people would probably never even know are franchises just so we can kind of contextualize what you're about to tell us about due diligence. Right. So when people think franchising, they automatically think food, mm -hmm. um, you know, or maybe, or, or other brick and mortar kinds of con you know, concepts, car washes, food, uh, laundromats, um, you know, retail, um, paint stores, whatever. But the truth is there are, literally 3,000 operating franchises in any given moment in time. Mm -hmm. And there's franchises for everything from being a franchise broker. Mm -hmm. That's a franchise. That's a franchise. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> to, um, oh my gosh, the whole category of home services, which is providing, if you just think about it, anybody that you would hire to do anything in your home. Like Ruth. Mary Maids? Or, maids, yeah. maids, mosquito, maids, mosquitoes, painting, uh, roofing, windows, fixing up your kitchen, remodeling. Wow. Okay. Um, there's business to business things where you're selling products and services to businesses, whether it's printing or shipping or this, uh, or, or the cleaning uh, strategies for exclusively for hotels and providing the cleaning services exclusively for hotels and wow. providing the bathroom cleaning services exclusively to restaurants. Guess what? That's a, a franchise for that. That's a service. <laughs> you have to have somebody come in three times a week and clean your darn bathroom unless wow. your employees are doing it. Wow. Um, there's franchises to service and clean fitness machines. There's serv mm -hmm. there's franchises to um, have events there's uh, I, I, there's I no talk. end it sounds like yes so that's perfect i love the that's a great you know feeder into like so if you want to own a franchise or you're thinking about it talk to us about what to do in that due diligence process so um the first thing that i think you should think about is really picture and imagine what you 
like to do, what you envision yourself doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And I can prompt that by asking some questions like, well, do you find that you get along well with blue collar workers? Do you find that you get along well with young kids, teenagers? Do you find that you're very good at a lot of balls in the air at the same time? And through those discussions, we sort of come to an understanding of some basic business attributes. Okay. I encourage people, don't think about a business name or think about the business attributes. Do you want to work Monday through Friday and be done at five o'clock? Do you want to network and join chambers and get to meet other small business owners? Do you envision yourself being involved at all in this business or do you envision yourself hiring a manager who's taking care of everything for you? That's a different kind of a business. Mm -hmm. Do you envision yourself being able to deal with 75 or 80 part-time employees or would you rather have four or less employees that are highly educated and they're your team and that right. you're meeting with your leadership team. So we, we talk about those business attributes and the good and bad about recurring revenue versus one-time larger ticket items versus. Okay. And what does recession resistant really mean? Because everybody right now is interested in a COVID proof business. Yeah, right. Sure, understandably. Well, if someone says yes to all the right questions in the little survey that you just gave and you feel like they are a good fit for a franchise, for franchise ownership, but they don't know what kind of franchise they would want to purchase, is that kind of step two in the due diligence process, helping them find one that suits, what is it, their personality, their training, what they like to buy or wear or do? I mean, how do you fit that? To the person. All that through through all those questions I was just covering and more. Okay. We then we then initially narrowed down by industry category. Okay. So okay, now I feel like because we've been chatting about the pros and cons of physical locations versus home base, where your trucks and techs versus warehouse versus wherever, we've narrowed it down to industries, and maybe we're going to be looking together at closet design because the person is interested in design. Maybe we're going to look wow. at decorating. Maybe we're going to look at uh, window you know, designing, maybe whatever. We've narrowed down to an industry. And then it's my job. That's where I take over. Okay. To go into my database of 800 brands and look at their disclosure documents, look at their lawsuits, look at their failure rates, look at their annual average income, if it is provided in the item 19. Mm -hmm. um, the due diligence process in my business is silly. It's so antiquated. It's embarrassing sometimes to be okay. part of this industry. <laughs> you cannot find anything of value on the internet. You mm. as a person could not go on the internet, find the disclosure document, find the average income. The sales teams are not allowed by Federal Trade Commission guidelines to make any sort of income projections to you. So it's really, not, oh wow. So like buying a resale, that's a shortcut for the purposes of this. There's a certain way in which they can do it, but it's very regulated. Um, and they can only do it if they have surveyed all their employees and put the documentation in their disclosures. Okay. okay. So it's not like buying a resale business where you can say, give me your last three years P and L's. I want to see what's the average income. No. Mm. Hence the need for some guidance. So we have all kinds of ways that we coach people through that process. You can ultimately get it and don't sign a contract until you've gotten it. Sure. Okay. But it's not the obvious ways in which you get that information. That's really interesting. So there's a lot more detective work, if you will, on that last piece there to get to closer to the actual sale and the final paperwork, if you will. But that's kind of where you come in as the high value component of the process, it sounds, it sounds like. So if I'm recapping correctly, Jane, we've got, we've talked through kind of what people need to be like personality wise and skill set wise. You've taken us through a lot of the due diligence components and then a little about what your role is. And is there more to that piece? Um, you know, let's say 
it's time, it's go time. How do you actually close the deal? What happens in this kind of third section here? Yeah. So um, what's good and bad about franchising, and I, and I didn't want to give the impression that it's so secretive, um, Federal Trade Commission regulates our sales process. So the brand is required at some point to provide you with this disclosure document well, be, well early on in your discovery process. And in that document is required to be the names and contact numbers of every single owner in the brand across the country. Okay. Including people that have left the brand. Wow. So why, is that? why do they let you, just to, to, so that you can ask back backlog questions about their experiences? Is it more like a hundred percent? Okay. It okay. came about because in the eighties, there was a bunch of really bad sales franchise sales development teams who lied. And so all of that was part of this decade long regulatory process. Okay. And it is designed so that before you sign a contract, you have the opportunity at least to communicate with other people to find out their real life experience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but anyway, yeah, at, at what will happen is we do an intake, we develop a profile on the client, on the you know person who's my client. We start hashing around industry ideas and I throw out ideas and they say, oh, I can't see myself doing that at all. Or, oh yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Then I do my piece. 15, 20 hours of research, see who's available in that market, who wants to, who wants you, my client, because mm -hmm. they have a profile of who they're looking for. Okay. Does it match up with their budget? I will typically want to get this person pre-qualified. So if they're wanting to get an SBA loan, I can make sure that's a possibility. Because if not, we have to go another way. Okay. Um, and ultimately I am coaching them through the sales process. I am not selling the franchise. That's not my role. Right. There's a development guy or gal who's doing that. I'm talking to you every week, kind of debriefing, mm -hmm. making sure you, did you ask this? Did you ask that? Okay. Now we want to start talking to franchisees. We have a whole coaching session around that. Okay. I provide them with tools and resources to capture the data of what they're hearing, like P&Ls, et cetera. Um, I've done all kinds of market studies on that particular market because a lot of these people are in towns that I don't know. So I have a software program. We've kind of researched what's there, what's not there. Is this going to be a good fit for that demographic market? Wow. At the end, they get coached through talking to franchisees when they're ready. I introduce them to five different franchise attorneys. Pick one. That's all these guys do is review documents. That's actually the first time somebody's written a check. Wow. Okay. Wow. That's a lot that you just said before that check got written. <laughs> so I always tell people, now's the time. If you're serious, you're going to have to pony up your $2,000. Not to me, right. to the Right. And you want to do that before you go to what's called Discovery Day. Discovery okay. Day is when you also spend your own money traveling to corporate office. You okay. Pre-COVID, now they're all virtual. Right. You go to corporate office, you sit down with the management team. You've been studying this franchise for three months. It's the first time you've met the principals. Oh my. It's an exciting day, I bet. A little nerve wracking, but probably exciting. Yep. Exactly. And, um, and then, uh, you know, and of course I can hook them up with the lenders and all that. But ultimately, if they invest in the franchise, that's how I'm paid. So I get paid. When oh, okay. The paid. Yeah, like, a, well, two things are on my mind. One is that I think you and I have a, a similarity I didn't realize, which is that I was thinking while you were explaining this, wow, you must know so much about other industries and other people and other sectors of, you know, the economy than you ever did before coming in to do the work that you do now because of all the digging and research that you just explained that you do when people do have that interest. And I feel the same about, you know, my ability to you know, work inside of businesses, pitch decks to learn what's making them tick and how they anticipate getting those sales. And I mean, I'm looking at things like, you know, business plans, financial projections, go to market strategies, competition. And so I get a little bit of a deep dive with every client that I meet too. And I love that because it keeps me, um, it keeps me learning all the time and determining kind of how 
um, you know, what, what areas most intrigue or interest me if I might go down and, and, and engage further with that company and because I loved it. But I bet you have the same kind of feeling. And then the other um, connection I'm making that you and I talked through is I'm kind of like a real estate agent. And I bet, you know, I bet your I nailed it feeling as a, as, as a, you know, in your work has to do with making the perfect match and seeing that happen, right? I mean, can you give us an example of one of your I nailed it feelings with a client? You don't have to give names, but what, what happened that, sure. that gave you that? Well, <clears throat> my first deal, I got in the business in 2015. Okay. And I reached out to a woman on LinkedIn because I have a special fondness for working with women. That's my branding is all around women oriented. Okay. That's good to know. And that's my area of specialization, if there is one, is that I love working with women in reinvention. So anyway, she, I reached out to her on LinkedIn because something she posted and sent her something. And four months later, she reaches out and she's kind of in a desperate situation. She just came out of a divorce. Mm -hmm. She has a child. She's renting her apartment. That right there, it means no loan. Right. Oh, okay. Right. Sure. Collateral. She has X amount of dollars and she has to make money quickly. And her background is hospitality. She had been doing sales in, in a catering company that treated her terribly. And she worked seven days a week and nights and mm -hmm. made kind of a lower salary. Mm -hmm. So we start putting two and two together and she ended up in a hospitality recruiting business. It's a brand name. If you work with, if you know anyone in the restaurant space and you, they all use recruiters okay. to, to hire their managers and okay. above. And they all use this particular recruiting company. It's very well known. It's, it's a brand name. And so that's a franchise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And she launched and I called her two weeks after training and she had made her first commission and it was $5,000. <laughs> and several months later, she called me and she said, I want you to know something. She said, don't ever feel like you're bugging people by following up. Cause I call, I have a CRM. I call them every month, low key. Hey, thinking of you, did you yeah. ever find anything? If I can help you in the future. So I had left her like four messages before she called me back. And she said, I feel that you were a, a, a gift from God. Oh my gosh. Wow. She said, you know, I really feel that she said, you are doing God's work. Oh, and I know. That, that's an I nailed it feeling if I ever heard one to say, 100%. oh, that's beautiful. That's just fantastic. What a great story to, I mean, and, and how great that it was at the beginning of your full you know, um, endeavor, right. if you have a fuel and the, and the certitude that you're doing the right thing, that you're good at what you do, that people, you know, found you to be so helpful and authentic and all the things that came in, into that comment. That's awesome. What a great story. Yeah, well, are, are you excited about, um, you know, right now, do you feel like there's a, a sense or a feeling among those you're working with now? Is there, is it more anxious um, or, you know, anxiety ridden or is there a lot of pressure amongst the folks that you're working with now that was not present prior to COVID? What have you noticed? Yeah, um, it's, a, it's a different, first of all, a lot of people are very focused on now and they want a business that's an essential service business. Okay. So, and I think that's great and I'm happy to show them those. But what I always point out is, look, when you sign a contract, it's a 10-year contract. So do you really think that for, the, for eight out of those 10 years, is this really the business that you're still going to want to be in, given that we're not in this environment anymore? For, and, and a lot of people really believe we're going to be in this environment for years and years and years to come. So I don't, but mm -hmm. I don't. I mean, it's my job to serve. It's my job to show you what you mm -hmm. believe and can get your arms around. So mm -hmm. I think there's that piece. I've never had a period before this where people came in knowing they wanted a specific kind of a business. Okay. They're really just locked in on this, you know, cleaning. And I point out, you know, this is not a glamorous business. You're talking about commercial cleaning. Um, yeah. 
<laughs> you know, better and, know a little bit about and, it and have some kind of a, an interest and passion that's yeah. in that, right? Yeah. And restoration. Yeah. I mean, you know, and so I say this is kind of the categories and these aren't sexy businesses. They're solid, can be solidly profitable businesses, mm -hmm. but you know, mm -hmm. is this something you think you would enjoy because you're in it for 10 years? Yeah, you know, I didn't realize you know, that. <laughs> I didn't know. Is that industry-wide, Jane, yeah. that it's 10 years? Yeah. Is, when did that come into place? Has it always been 10 yeah. years? Like Contracts are typically 10. There's a few that are 20 and some that are five, but it's very often 10. And the reality is people often buy a business, build it up, and sell it. So you may not be in it 10 years, but you've got to build this thing to a really good profitable position mm -hmm. so that you can sell it for five times your investment or whatever mm -hmm. you're going for, you know, in five, six, seven years. So you're going to have to work hard at it to get it to that point. Right. A lot of people are, on, you know, serial franchise buyers, mm -hmm. build it, sell it, buy it, yep. build it, sell it, buy it, build it, sell it. And also buy it, build it, and then add on to the portfolio because yep. now I have the technicians and they're, cleaning windows, but they could also clean carpets. And they could also, you know, so they add on all these- Service arms, I guess. Yeah. Is that what you're talking about? So Jane, that's a great point. You've talked a lot about the people you're helping who um, want to buy a franchise and run it and, you know, own their own business in a sense. What about people who, you know, do you help people with Hey, I've got this amazing business and I want to duplicate it regionally. How do I do you, you know, and what quick, we could just touch on that one. We don't have a ton more time, but that's a, you know, what kind of uh, mindset does that person need? Because, you know, that's probably a unique subset um, of a, you know, in terms of personality traits to say, I'm willing to give other people a go at my brand. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I want to come back and just clarify something. So there's two sure. people that buy franchises, the owner operator people. Those are the people that are worried, worried about their jobs. They're in oil and gas. They need a way to make a living. Okay. Um, that's probably 80% of my clients. The other 20% are wealthy people that are absentee owners and they're looking for alternate streams of income. Okay. Um, and they're just adding on to their portfolio, you know, because of the rich man, poor man book, you know, they, wow. they realize they need an income. They need a salary, they want rental property, and they want a business stream. They want three alternative income streams. Um, the what was the question? I apologize. Well, it's okay. What what kind, you know, when you do you oh, help people you want to start their own? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't do that. There are companies that specialize in it, but I will be happy to have a conversation with you about what it takes because I know what it takes. Yeah. And um I'll just cut to the chase and say what it takes is a minimum of $100,000. Okay. Um, okay. And, and truthfully, to do it right, it should be five times that. And wow. you may get lucky if you have a little store and you do well and you put up a sign and you say, would you like to franchise this store? You may sell a few more, but mm -hmm. to really scale it and get to that 100 plus locations, mm -hmm. which less than... 7% of franchises ever get to, wow. um, you are going to need a lot of capital and a lot of backing. Okay. Um, but the answer is brand it right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, make sure that the unit economics work. Nobody wants to buy a business to make $30,000. That's what I call mm -hmm. a hobby. Yeah, uh, right. It's not a business. <laughs> and right. so make sure your business, the owner, can recreate this in net six figures. Okay. Um, not make that happen. You know, wow. It's a big commitment then. I mean, there's a lot going into that and you need to have the capital behind you to make the investment happen, to make that income stream come alive. It sounds, but it sounds exciting. It sounds really exciting. And, and uh, it's been growing in the last couple of decades into such a totally new space of web businesses that are not always brick and, uh, brick and mortar. So that's been an, one of the interesting pieces I've learned since we started chatting about it. Well, Jane, thank you for kind of walking us through those three points. I'm going to close us up with some rapid fire questions that are more about, you know, you and some of your preferences. So I have two questions for you. And the first one is, what is a book that you are reading right now that's on your nightstand, if you will, or maybe on your phone that you're, that you're reading? And what is one thing you'd like to share with us about Oh, a way it's helping you think differently or just a, a tip from it or anything that you'd like to share? 
Um, so I'm always reading three books. I'm one of those people. Okay. And um, so the book that I sit by my meditation altar is a Jack Kornfeld book called Bringing Home the Dharma. And we could go on and on about his style of teaching, but it's, it's about awakening right where you are. And um, so, the, so, you know, what I am learning is to be content with what I have exactly as things are. And I'm one of those people that always, 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 when I wake up in the morning, I am thinking about things to make that day better, to make my business better, to make my family better. Mm -hmm. And I am learning that uh, sort of the secret to happiness is just being 100% awake in this life, in this moment, and it's perfect as it is. Oh, that's a great theme and reminder, especially amidst all the unrest happening in our lives in 2020 so far. So thank you. That's even inspired me to go about my day and make it great after we kind of close up our call today. But that's fantastic. My second question is, um, can you tell us about a, a mentor or a professor or teacher who had a real influence on your life? early in your career or, or a person it doesn't have to be someone older than you or, but who's really kind of changed your life for the better, but you maybe didn't know it at the time. I'm going to flip it on you. And I'm going to say that I had a lot of business mentors, uh, but the one that's the person who's had the most impact on me to improve myself is Elliot. I thought you might say that, <laughs> which I think is, is fantastic. So can you expand on how? Yeah, you know, Elliot is someone who, because of his autism, that's kind of his greatest gift. The kid has absolutely no ability for guile, to try and impress you, to not say exactly what's in his head. Um, and so it, and he's brutally honest, like yeah. all the time with yeah. himself too. He doesn't mm -hmm. pretend mm -hmm. um, to be someone that he's not. Mm -hmm. And so there are just so many Elliotisms. I can't even begin to tell you, but it, the joy of, of raising a young man who has had to struggle for everything that he's ever achieved and just perseveres. He just perseveres. And most of the time with a pretty good outlook, he's pretty aware yes, of he is. Yes. what he is, what he isn't, what his strengths, what his weaknesses, what he, what he wants to do. I remember when he wanted to go to college, I started prepping him when he was in eighth grade about maybe trade schools or fantastic mm -hmm. opportunities, you know, two-year colleges to be a uh, electrician, those guys make a huge amount of money. And he turned to me eighth grade and said, mom, I am not going to a two-year college. I <laughs> love talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. No, I, um, I remember feeling uh, at least a sliver of that when I worked with Elliot, because I worked with him every Saturday for an hour for 10 or 12 or more yeah. weeks. That the whole summer, summer. It seemed like and it was. It was really refreshing, and it was a gift to get to know someone who was not putting on an air, or who could and could not really, you know, and, and to engage him at a totally different level than I do other clients of mine. Um, it would be fun for me to go back through some of the notes that I took um, about that. It's been several years, but yep, he's a he's an awesome kid, and I. I bet that makes complete sense that he has had such an impact on you as a person, but as a mom, of course, too. So it's also, I'll just throw this out. I know you want to end. It's very interesting raising a child who cannot lie. No, not kidding. <laughs> cannot <laughs> lie. Right. Right. <laughs> oh, and, and he's really gifted. And he's got a lot of great skills when it comes to his tech background and now he's out there looking for jobs and doing what he can and um i'll quickly i just remembered that one day when i took him around i took him on a field trip you may remember this we went around to stores that are in our area up here in fort collins and i was helping him get that elevator pitch 
better and, and pretend that he was looking for a job. And, and he was terrified, I'm pretty sure, about doing it. But the first time he went into a store, and then the second time he got a little bit better. And then he kept, he kind of like started taking me around. He's like, let's go there and check out what they do. And I mean, that was just, it was such a fun day. And I, I, I wonder what he thinks back about when he, when he looks at that day, if he remembers that. Um, but it was, it was really fun to do that with him and to share some of his growth spurts and communications. Um, well, Jane, how can, this has been so much fun. And thanks for joining us today. When, if people have questions about how to do the franchise, do you best and do you have, um, you know, just some basic info you can share? Sure. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn, Jane Stein, Franchise Broker. In fact, I think I have a customized name that's Franchise Help. Um, my business is okay. called Four Franchises Waiting. So if you can remember that long, ridiculous name, Your Franchise is Waiting, Google it, I'm there. Uh, but Jane Stein LinkedIn, and if you put Franchise Help, I think it'll pop right up. Awesome. Yeah, actually, I love the name of your business. It's very clever. And my uh, rhetorical brain kind of likes it because it's already telling me that I'm, it's waiting for me. So I might be a good fit for it. <laughs> well, thank you, Jane. Thank you so much for, for your time today. And um, we, will, we will definitely post this on our channels and invite you to do the same. And hope you have a wonderful rest of your 2020. And we'll be in touch soon. Take okay. care. Thanks, thank Cindy. You. Yes, absolutely. Bye.